Hey YouTube, that Brady Chick here, and I'm here today in my very comfortable position. Do not judge me please, because it's one of those days. It's very rainy outside, and I feel a little bit lazy. So anyway, y'all don't care. So we're just gonna get right into it and talk about these lab values, including electrolytes and toxic values that you should know. Right, so I have with me on hand my notes that I made for this video that are all based on question banks and just YouTube videos that I've watched when I was prepping for my NCLEX, and I also have my lab values sheet from my nursing school when I was in nursing school December graduate here we're just gonna use that as reference I'm going to give you the values that the NCLEX expects you to know because I know every hospital facility is different you might see different number ranges in different facilities depending on where you're at and NCLEX is aware of this too by the way NCLEX is aware that different facilities will have different number ranges for these electrolytes if I could give you guys any advice my advice would be do not go solely based on off of what your hospital facility deems accurate for these ranges because the NCLEX might be different, okay? So just be wary of that. Starting with some electrolytes here, potassium, sodium, and calcium. So I wanna start with potassium because that's one of the big electrolytes that we should look out for because high potassium and low potassium can both lead to cardiac dysrhythmias. And cardiac dysrhythmias would be like the ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, which is probably one of the worst ones. I don't know if it's the worst, Worst, maybe asystole would be the worst. That's literally the flat line. Um, Torsades de point when you have that low magnesium. Oh, atrial fibrillation, right? That's a very common one that's not so deadly, but it's still something to treat, you know? So those are cardiac dysrhythmias that can literally be caused by low or high potassium, with the exception of torsades de point, which is caused by low magnesium. Hospitals should all have this range, but the NCLEX definitely will expect you to know this range as well. 3.5 to 5 for normal potassium. So it's a very narrow range. It's a very small range. So anything below 3.5 will cause a dysrhythmia. Anything above 5 will also cause a dysrhythmia, right? So you just, you never want to have low or high potassium. Like pretty much potassium always has to be within that 3.5 to 5 range. Otherwise, we can expect some heart issues. So that's potassium. <laughs> Um, should I tell you guys how to treat it? Okay, I'm gonna make this as quick as possible. But basically, in terms of how to treat high potassium, there's a number of things you can use that will lower potassium. So for example, furosemide, aka Lasix, that's a loop diuretic, right? A diuretic. So with diuretics, we know that they cause a lot of diuresis, which is peeing, right? Through peeing, that diuretic is decreasing the blood pressure because it's decreasing the fluid out of our body by peeing it all out. But what is it also decreasing? Electrolytes like potassium. That's why diuretics are called potassium wasting because they literally waste the potassium in the urine. Because if you're expelling fluid, you're most likely expelling electrolytes too. So that's why if you have a patient that has a lot of uh, nausea vomiting episodes, vomiting, you're expelling fluid. What follows fluid? electrolytes, right? So you can even lose potassium through vomiting. Diarrhea, you're expelling fluid through your poop because poop is filled with fluid, like water. In order to form the poop, it absorbs the water. So water is being expelled, but also electrolytes are following that water within the poop. So that's why when you poop, you can also lose your potassium, right? For example, the ones that decrease fluid, again, would be the furosemide, Lasix. k exalate is used to decrease potassium as well, and I remember it because k exalate starts with a K and the symbol for potassium is K. Also, Mark Klemek actually taught me this next part. K exhalates, you can also think of K exits late, meaning that the potassium, which is the K, exits the body late, right? So it takes a while for K exhalate to actually decrease your potassium pretty much. So if a patient has really, really high potassium, aka hyperkalemia, the first thing you do will not be to give them K exhalate because K exits late, right? If they're in a severe hyperkalemia crisis right now, you want to give them something that's going to decrease that potassium soon, like quick fast, you know? We would have to give them something like either calcium gluconate or insulin and dextrose. So with those two, there are very minute differences between the two in terms of when you should use them. This is what I learned from simple nursing. So with calcium gluconate, you mainly use that if they have hyperkalemia or hypokalemia and associated cardiac dysrhythmia mentioned with it. So if they have hyperkalemia and VTAC, then you give them calcium gluconate because calcium gluconate glues 
the heart muscles together to make them less hyperactive or hypoactive if it's like hypokalemia. So calcium gluconates is only if that person with high or low potassium also has a cardiac dysrhythmia. So think of it as cardiac dysrhythmia starts with C, calcium gluconate also starts with C, right? So if that person has a cardiac dysrhythmia along with the hyper or hypokalemia, then give them calcium gluconate pretty much right c and c and then with the iv insulin and dextrose so insulin actually decreases potassium too we know that insulin also decreases blood glucose because it brings that glucose from the blood back into the cells which then decreases that glucose within the actual blood that's how insulin works but insulin also brings potassium back into the cells too hence why it decreases that hyperkalemia emia means in the blood right so it decreases that high potassium in the blood by bringing it back into the cells instead of hanging out in the blood. So you would use IV insulin and dextrose because sometimes you can decrease the glucose too much because remember at the end of the day you're giving them insulin. Insulin is not only going to target the potassium, it's obviously going to target glucose too so it's going to bring down the glucose and you don't want the person to become hypoglycemic just because you're correcting their hyperkalemia with insulin, right? So that's why we're giving them dextrose as well as the insulin just to protect them from going into that hypoglycemia episode. Keep the glucose levels at bay when you're giving them insulin. But yeah, insulin will decrease their potassium and it's given in situations where the person has high potassium, not low, but high potassium with no cardiac dysrhythmia mentioned. So if the question just mentions that the patient's potassium is a six, right? Which is definitely out of that 3.5 to five range. And yeah, you would click the option of giving them insulin and dextrose, right? You wouldn't give them calcium gluconate in that case because there's no cardiac dysrhythmia mentioned but if that person has a potassium of six plus they're experiencing VTAC or they'll say plus they're experiencing those wide QRS complexes with that tombstone shape which is pretty much VTAC that's how they describe VTAC then we know that that's a cardiac dysrhythmia plus hyperkalemia so let's give them calcium gluconate to bring down that potassium and to control that heart to control that cardiac dysrhythmia right because C and C <sighs> hopefully that makes sense and then in order to increase potassium of course Course, then you give them potassium, right? So if a person has hypokalemia, which is anything less than 3.5, so let's say they have a potassium of 2, that's really low, and that can also lead to cardiac dysrhythmias. With hypokalemia, we're going to give them potassium chloride. That's usually what it's called, and I think it comes in tablet form, or you can give it IV. Also, keep in mind that IV is quick, is probably the quickest route of medication, right? It's much faster than PO, much faster than IM, ID. IV is like the quickest route of medication because it goes straight into the veins and it just absorbs really quick because of that. If a person is in severely low potassium, like 2.0, then yeah, you might want to give them IV potassium chloride so that we can give them some potassium and increase it so that it goes back to normal. So, sorry, I went kind of in detail with potassium because that's a very important electrolyte that you do need to know. And then there's also sodium. So sodium is 135 to 145. With sodium, you should know that low sodium usually causes seizures. So if a question ever or if a case study rather because this is NGN now if a case study ever gives you cues that a person has low sodium for example let's say this person has SIADH right with SIADH I'm gonna go into that in detail in a separate video but with SIADH just to put it briefly you are soaked inside so when you're soaked inside that means that you're holding in a lot of water and if you're holding in a lot of water that water is gonna dilute out all those solutes like sodium so that's gonna make sodium sodium appear low, right? Because there's so much water that the sodium is just not enough to compensate it. So if that sodium goes low to the point of being 120 millimoles, which is now lower than that 135 to 145 range, anything 120 or lower will actually lead to seizures or can lead to seizures. So if a question or a case study is hinting at the fact that someone has low sodium, like with SIADH, then seizure precautions would be part of the interventions, right? Like seizure precautions would be putting up the padded side rails because if they do go into a seizure and they end up like hitting the side rail you don't want them to get injured so that's why the side rails have to be padded and you also have to have that suction device in the room just in case when they're seizing you know they end up like aspirating some material you do have to suction that out after they're done seizing I believe because during the seizure you're not supposed to stick anything in their mouth right because they can end up choking turn them to the side so that you're opening that airway because remember airways are primary issue for anything it's usually left lateral 
sterile position. But yeah, so that's seizure precautions pretty much that you would implement for someone with low sodium. Similarly, with low calcium, you also have to implement seizure precautions. Calcium has two different ranges, but I think that NCLEX goes by the milligram per deciliter range versus the millimole range. So just so you guys have all the information, calcium's millimole range would be 2.25 to 2.75. That I'm not sure that NCLEX goes by, but that's definitely with something my nursing school went by. That's the millimole range, which I don't think you'll be tested on or be expected to know. But for the milligram per deciliter range, I think that's the one you're expected to know for calcium. So calcium's milligram per deciliter range would be 9 to 11, I believe. If that calcium is low, so let's say it's 7 milligram per deciliter, then that can actually lead to seizures too. Similar to how sodium being low can also lead to seizures. So how I remember that is that Na is the symbol for sodium. CA is the symbol for calcium. They both have that little A in it, that lowercase a in it. So that kind of reminds me that both of them kind of can cause the same thing if they're both low, which is seizures. That's kind of the pattern that I picked up there. Oh yeah, so back to sodium. So high sodium now can cause fluid retention. For example, someone with heart failure cannot have anything high in sodium. They can't have chips, they can't have canned food, they can't have meats. All those things will cause fluid retention. And with heart failure, especially right-sided heart failure, they already have that peripheral edema. So adding all that extra salt will just worsen that peripheral edema and make the fluid worse because water follows sodium. But it's a little odd because with SIADH and with diabetes insipidus, for example, Water doesn't necessarily follow sodium in those cases, right? Those are the exceptions, I guess, to the rule. But we'll get into that in the separate video. So yeah, low calcium can cause seizures, but also low calcium or hypocalcemia, not to be confused with hypokalemia, which is low potassium, but hypocalcemia can also cause trousseaux and Schwastek sign. So trousseaux would be that twerk of the wrist, which I remember because trousseau starts with T and twerk also starts with T. So there's a twerk of the wrist, but in a certain circumstance. And that circumstance would be when a blood pressure cuff is applied to their arm of that same wrist. And when that cuff inflates and squeezes their arm, there's a twerk that occurs in response to that squeezing. And then Schwastek sign is when you stroke their cheek and then they kind of smirk with it. So I remember that because Schwastek starts with a CH and cheek also starts with a CH, right? So trousseau, that twerk of the wrist, and Schwastek sign, that smirk when you're stroking their cheek, those two things happen with hypo calcemia, right? And another thing you should know about hypocalcemia usually happens during um, a thyroidectomy. So your thyroid is right here in your neck and when part of this thyroid is cut out, which is the ectomy part of thyroidectomy, it typically cuts out the parathyroid glands as well, which are like located right behind the thyroid. So when those parathyroid glands are cut out, it's going to cause calcium to be low because the parathyroid glands release calcium. They increase calcium in the body. So if they're not there anymore, then calcium is going to be low, which then cause the positive trousseau and positive schwast sign which you don't really want to right. see. Then there's magnesium. So this one I had to look up on Google because it's not on my sheet here but magnesium says 1.7 to 2.2 milligrams per deciliter. To be honest magnesium values change all the time. Like I even remember seeing like 0.85 to like 1.3 or something. I don't know it just changes all the time. I think for something like magnesium they'll probably give the range to you on the NCLEX hopefully at least because it's kind of a tricky one to remember because you'll see different values for magnesium like everywhere. For sodium, potassium, and calcium, those three you kind of see more often than you would magnesium, you know? Like nursing questions, question banks, you normally see those three values being mentioned, but magnesium is not typically mentioned, especially when it comes to being asked about the actual range of magnesium. So hopefully the range will be given to you. If not, hopefully the question will actually state that a person has low magnesium or high magnesium. So what you should know about magnesium is that if it is low, it could cause torsades de points, which which is a cardiac dysrhythmia, right? Another thing you should know about magnesium itself is that magnesium is that mellow electrolyte. So what does mellow mean? Mellow means like very relaxed, very calm, very slow moving, right? Like if your magnesium is high, then you're very high mellow, which means you're very relaxed, like excessively relaxed actually. And low magnesium does the opposite because if your mellow is low, meaning if your magnesium is low, then you're gonna be the opposite of mellow, which is excitable, right? 
right? Which is why the low magnesium then leads to the excitable cardiac dysrhythmia of torsades de points, right? Because when you have torsades de points, the heart is just overactive. It looks like a tornado. It means tornado of the points. Tornadoes are definitely not calm, okay? I don't know who told you they were, but they're definitely not. <laughs> but, and probably even, I don't know if it would lead to seizures, but it would make sense because with seizures, that's actually an excitable event as well. Like you're tremoring, out of control, kind of. Yeah, you see, when you make those connections, you actually get the answer right because look, low levels of sodium, which I told you guys already, low levels of calcium, again, which I told you guys already, and low levels of magnesium can alter the electrical activity of the brain cells and cause seizures. So for all those three things, you need to implement seizure precautions. If your mellow is low, you need to go because you're too excited about Okay, Ugh, anything that helps you guys remember. <laughs> magnesium sulfate, by the way, which is that IV medication that's usually used for preeclampsia, which is, again, seizures for pregnancy. Magnesium sulfate is meant to mellow out their muscles, mellow out their muscles so that it prevents the seizures from happening, right? Because if the muscles are not mellow, then they're gonna be hyperexcitable. That's why we're giving them the mellow. We're giving them mellow magnesium in order to mellow out their muscles and make them less excited and more relaxed so that they don't have a seizure. If you ever see the word magnesium on the exam, just replace it with the word mellow and hopefully that'll help you. So low mellow is the opposite of mellow because you're excitable. High mellow means you're too relaxed, you're too mellow. Okay, all right, then we can move on to the kidney lab. So kidney labs would be like the BUN and the creatinine. So BUN should be 10 to 20, easy range. Just know that anything above 20 means that the patient is either experiencing a kidney issue or they're dehydrated, right? Because BUN could be for multiple reasons. It doesn't just have to be kidney related, but for creatinine, and creatinine is more specific to the kidneys, which is why it's that number one kidney lab. Creatinine, just think of it as creatinine greater than 1.3 equals bad kidney. So you just want creatinine to be under 1.3. Okay, creatinine. so for this next one, they might not even test you about it, but I did get one question out of many question banks about it, and this would be ESR and CRP. So these are kind of like the inflammatory markers. They pretty much much mark or indicate that there's general inflammation happening somewhere in the body, right? It's not even specific to anything. It just gets elevated when there's inflammation happening somewhere in the body. So for example, if you have like conjunctivitis, like a very inflamed eye, your ESR and your CRP are gonna increase a little bit, but it'll never let you know that the inflammation is happening at the eye. It'll just tell you that there's inflammation happening somewhere, you know? So it's not very specific. So ESR normal value would be 10 to 20. CRP normal value would be less than 0.3. So an interesting question that I got was, out of the patients with the following labs, which patient can the LPN take care of? And A was like troponin level of 0.08. B was a potassium level of six. C was an ESR of 10. And D was a CRP of 0.5. And the answer was actually C, which was an ESR of 10. Why? Because that's that's the only lab value there that's within normal range. So that means that that's the only stable patient in that list. Because if they have a normal lab value, then they're stable, right? Everyone else there is actually not stable. And it's tricky because CRP is not really a cause for concern, you know, when it's elevated. But because it's still not technically within normal range, we can never say that that's a stable patient versus the patient that has the ESR of 10, right? Because 10, we know for sure, is within that normal ESR our range but CRP it's not within normal range so they're just automatically not stable yeah so that's why the LPN who only takes stable patients just like the UAP the LPN would have to take on C a troponin I slash T should be generally less than 0.04 so I think for this one the NCLEX might give you the range like especially if it's within a case study like the normal range so you don't really have to memorize it but still good to know because if those troponin levels are elevated it means that there are some type of a attack on the heart, right? A heart attack, an MI basically. Elevated troponin levels indicate a damaged heart. So for example, I had a case study that was pretty much trying to rule out whether this person had an MI or whether they were just experiencing a panic attack. So they had the symptoms of an MI being like high heart rate, diaphoresis. Those are also symptoms of a panic attack. So in the next slide, it actually showed me that their troponin levels were actually normal. 
because it was under that 0 0.04. I think it was like 0 0.02 was their actual troponin level. For that reason, we know that they're not experiencing an MI because there's no cardiac damage, but they do have, we have to look at the facts. And the fact of the matter is their troponin levels are normal. So now we have to just cross out MI completely from that scenario and think, okay, no, this person is experiencing a panic attack because their heart is fine, but they have the symptoms of high heart rate, sweating, nausea. But yeah, like those are symptoms of a panic attack. So then we go with panic attack because again, we ruled out an MI since their heart is fine. Hopefully that makes sense. So now we can move on to the bone marrow. So within the bone marrow, we have red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So with red blood cells, they are usually 4.6 to 6, or sometimes 4.5 to 6. I think for that one, you'll probably get the normal range on the NCLEX, but again, it's good to know white blood cells should be 5 to 10. That's what I've mainly been seeing across question banks and even across YouTube videos. Platelets should be 150 to 400. I feel like that's definite like that's that's the standard anything lower than the platelet range means that there's gonna be bleeding and anything higher than that platelet range means that there's too much clotting right because you don't want too much platelets because that means too much clotting which can lead to blood clots which can lead to stroke with low red blood cells um, you get anemia with high red blood cells you get polycythemia which can then cause that high blood pressure because there's too many red blood cells circulating now which then causes pressure within the blood vessels hence the high blood pressure. White blood cells 5 to 10. Low white blood cells means that you're immunocompromised, which means that you have a low immune system, so you're unable to fight these infections. Even simple infections like the flu would be hard for you to fight. High white blood cells pretty much means that an infection is most likely present and your blood cells are trying to, in a sense, multiply, I guess, in order to fight off that current infection that you're facing. So pretty much whether the white blood cells are low or high, it's still a concern because it means an infection. It's not not always the priority depending on the situation but just know that whether white blood cells are low or high an infection is present or impending and again with the white blood cells you want to watch out for things that are going to immunosuppress that patient right so if someone already has low white blood cells like if they have a white blood cell count of three which is three thousand then that means if they take an immunosuppressant like etanercept which intercepts the immune system is how simple nursing taught me to think about it because if it intercepts the immune system then it causes is immunosuppression which will then make it hard for you to fight off infection and if this person already has a white blood cell of three then it's already hard for them to fight off the infections and now you're gonna give them a tanner sept to make it even harder to fight off infection that person's gonna go into septic shock and die unfortunately that's a reality that's why we have to like look at the white blood cell count or the CBC in general which is that complete blood cell count before giving them things like immunosuppressant other immunosuppressants to look out for would be like steroids Steroids are immunosuppressants and they also can cause osteoporosis over time. Oh, chemotherapy and radiation, those are also immunosuppressants too because it causes bone marrow suppression. And remember, if something causes bone marrow suppression, then that means it decreases all the things that are included in the bone marrow, which means all the red blood cells, all the platelets, all the white blood cells, all those things will be decreased. So because red blood cells will be low, you'll have anemia. Because platelets will be low, you'll have bleeding. Low white blood cells, then it'll be harder for you to fight off infection. So with those patients, we typically tell them to avoid big crowds just because within big crowds, you don't know who's sick within that group of people and it's very easy to catch infection that way. We also tell them to avoid raw food like raw fruits and vegetables, raw meat because those contain bacteria. We also tell them to wash their hands, which is like the number one prevention of bacteria spreading. Okay, so now we can go into like the miscellaneous things like albumin, for example. So albumin is interesting because it has the exact same range as potassium. Albumin is that kind of like protein protein substance that we have in our bodies and with cirrhosis albumin is typically low there's fluid overload right because Ooh, sorry. that probably made you guys yawn too sorry about that <laughs> But yeah, if albumin is low, why the person with cirrhosis has that abdominal ascites. So albumin is not something that's frequently tested. I haven't seen it on a lot of my question banks, but sometimes it's checked in order to look for nutritional deficiencies. Like I did get a question once that was asking about an elderly patient and what's the best way to check if they're getting enough nutrients and 
the answer was actually to check their albumin level versus checking their BMI or their sleep patterns or something like it was just check their albumin yeah that was like one of the questions I got out of many question right, banks so now for the toxic substances which are the toxic medications that patients might be prescribed so starting with digoxin digoxin the toxin so digoxin is meant to help the heart contract better digoxin does cause stronger contractions but it's just slower because of that digoxin also helps to decrease the heart rate one thing we do have to look out for with digoxin would be to check how much digoxin is being retained in the patient's body, right? Digoxin's normal range is 0.5 to 2. So anything over 2 would be digoxin toxicity. Like seeing green or yellow halos and sometimes they'll say like difficulty reading, right? Things like that will be a sign of toxicity. Then you'll probably think, okay, this person's on digoxin. They have a digoxin value that's greater than 2 it's probably digoxin toxicity. Anything lower than 0.5 would probably just mean that they're not getting enough digoxin, but that typically doesn't really happen and I've never gotten a question like that. We definitely don't want that. So lithium is interesting as well because lithium has the same or similar range to creatinine. So creatinine should be 0.6 to 1.3 and lithium should also be 0.6 to 1.3 or sometimes I've, I've seen 1.2. Interestingly enough, lithium toxicity doesn't really occur until that lithium level reaches 1.3. So anything over 1.5 is lithium toxicity. Of course, anything over 2 is still lithium toxicity, but I've heard a lot of people saying that lithium toxicity starts at a level of 2, but it actually starts at a level of over 1.5. The side effects of lithium toxicity would be with lithium toxicity, it typically starts out with some GI side effects like upset stomach, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, things like that, and then it can progress into the more neuro side effects like slurred speech, ataxia, which is when you have that unsteady gait, confusion, etc. Especially if the question mentions that the patient has been on lithium and now they're experiencing those side effects, then of course you want to think, okay, maybe lithium toxicity. Um, another one would be filling and phenytoin. So fillings would be like those asthma medications. I believe they're bronchodilators, but they can become pretty toxic. So fillings would be like theophylline, for example, which is a popular one. And then phenytoin would be to prevent seizures. They don't treat acute seizures, meaning they're not given for people who are currently experiencing seizures. That would be usually benzodiazepines because they work so much quicker. Phenytoin, phenytoin prevents future seizures. It does not happen right away like benzodiazepines. Phenytoins and phillines have the same range as BUA. So anything over 20 is toxic for phenytoin and toxic for theophylline. Oh, and I guess I can tell you guys glucose too. So glucose in milligrams per deciliter on question banks on the NCLEX, because the NCLEX would expect you to know this would be 70 to 100 milligram per deciliter or sometimes it's 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter the question will make it obvious enough if the glucose is really high or really low so if it's really low it might say something like the glucose is 60 or if it's really high it might say something like the glucose is 165 like that's definitely out of range for both of those just remember anything less than 70 would be hypoglycemia hypogly the brain might die is something you should remember because that's the main reason why hypoglycemia is a primary concern because if the brain is about to die everything else pretty much shuts off right the brain controls our breathing it has the vomiting center controls our movements our thoughts our cognition obviously we definitely don't want the patient to go into hypoglycemia because it's super deadly and then with hyperglycemia it's definitely not as deadly sometimes it's like last on the list in terms of being a priority sometimes not all the time but yeah like being in the 165 range it's it's not much of a cause for concern like like, yes, the person is super hyperglycemic, but we can treat it with insulin super quick because the insulin's gonna bring down that blood glucose. Out of the two, we're most worried about hypo glycemia. Anyways, guys, that is everything I have for you today. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully you learned something from this video. I really tried to make it quick for you guys, so let me know how I did there. I don't know, because <laughs> I know I kind of talk a lot, but I'm just trying to give you guys all the information you need to know, okay? All the information that helped me succeed, you know, because all of these things I'm telling you are from UWorld question banks, are from Kaplan question banks, YouTube resources that I used, like Simple Nursing, even Mark Klemek, Nexus Nursing, Registered Nurse RN, and collects high yield all those resources i'm pretty much like combining together and giving to you guys so hopefully it helps anyways catch you guys in the next video i'm probably gonna make another NCLEX tips video sometime soon hopefully i can edit that out and get it out
out to you as soon as possible because I know a lot of you are taking your NCLEX very soon. So thanks again for watching, again. And always remember, natural hair grows. Don't you forget it. Bye. Oh, 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 the pretty girl.